Hi, this is Professor McGuire, and welcome to this video lecture session on focusing on public access to the coastal zone as part of our examination of ocean policy and law issues, and specifically uh, in this subcategory, focusing on coastal issues in the United States. So let's talk a little bit about what it means in the United States to have public access to the coastal zone by looking at some of the law and policy frameworks that apply. By way of introduction, fundamentally, access is about balancing private and public rights in the United States. When we talk about access, we're talking about an area of land where the uplands, the land that is dry, meets the water in um, a coastal zone areas. So fundamentally, what we're talking about is we're talking about um, the notion of private rights as far as private citizens and those citizens that might live and own land in coastal areas and near shore coastal areas of the United States. And one of the questions that we have to deal with that was dealt with in terms of the discussion, which is in a previous uh, video uh, lecture session, you can find out all about the way in which we define those private and public rights uh, in more detail in that video lecture, uh, which is in the playlist uh, on the um, on this YouTube channel, uh, which will be identified at the end, certainly by at the end of this video. But you can I, you can see uh, some of the details of those private rights and public rights. But just in terms of a quick summary, uh, we certainly allow for private interests in land that is located proximate to the coastline and even right up abutting the shore. And the question is, where is the shore? Is it where the we understand that uh, most people that live near coastal areas understand that we have tidal ranges, that the ocean uh, has a high tide and it has a low tide. And sometimes that's once a day, sometimes multiple times a day, depending on the area you live. And sometimes the difference between high tide and low tide can be significant. You can have really, really large tidal ranges, uh, depending on the geomorphology of the area, depending on the time of year, the time of the month, uh, moon, uh, the moon's effect, that kind of thing, depending on positioning of the earth and other uh, gravitational forces that affect it. But the point is, um, in the United States, generally speaking, um, most states, private landowners own to the high tide mark, to where the water meets the land at the high tide. In some states, including Massachusetts, where I live and work, um, you know, and, and a few others, um, they private landowners own to the low tide uh, mark. So you can imagine that in many states, nobody owns uh, the area, whether it's dry or wet, of where there's water from high tide, uh, from the point of high tide, where, where the water touches. And it's the mean high tide, by the way. There are different types. There are king tides, uh, neap tides. There are different uh, high tide. So we're talking about the average high tide, the regular normal average high tide. It's delineated or it can be delineated in a particular area, identified, quantified, and then that private land ownership begins at that point. For some places like Massachusetts, the private landowner owns to the low tide mark, which again, it's the mean low tide mark, and also something that can be identified and delineated. But what that means is that for those certain states like Massachusetts and a few others, um, the private landowner owns submerged land. It actually owns the land that is submerged at high tide, that intertidal zone, we sometimes call it, that place between the high and low tide. Uh, private landowners can own that, that piece of property. It can be privately owned. And all of this, of course, suggests that um, there are public rights involved, and certainly that's true, because normally, outside of that small variation I just quickly summarized, the rest of submerged land, all of submerged land, is generally speaking held by the public. So the public owns all submerged land, and it's generally held in trust um, by whatever government, if it's the state that owns that particular piece of submerged land, right, if it's the local uh, city or municipality, or if it's the federal government, they own that submerged land and they hold that ownership in trust. It's called the public trust doctrine. Again, something that we discuss in a, another video. And I'll provide a link uh, to that video earlier in this if I can and uh, when I can uh, during an editing process. But you'll certainly find uh, the connection to those videos. The playlist is the Ocean Policy and Law, also under the um, video lectures. But Ocean Policy and Law playlist would be the one where you can find more information on access and, and, and public and private rights in general before this. Uh, this is a little bit nuanced video off of that general information. So 
the public uh so so when we say that fundamentally when we talk about uh access rights access is about balancing those private rights and private interests where a, a citizen has and of course that private landowner has both their private rights and interests and of course as a citizen or as a member of the united states they also have public interests as well so they have both of the interests if we want to talk about public and private room. But those that do not own that near coastal real estate, they don't really have the private interest. At least they can't exercise any private interest. They can purchase, if they can, coastal property um, and then have that private interest. But ultimately, or they can even negotiate, and we'll talk about that. They can negotiate uh, uh, you know, some sort of uh, rights uh, with landowners, maybe, uh, to have a right of access that otherwise isn't provided to the public. Uh, and they can have some interest. Um, so it's not ownership in general of the land that's required. It gets into a little bit of detail. Uh, for those that are interested more in that, you can look at the environmental law series and you can look at property rights, uh, specifically when we talk about land. So there's a, a video on land and talking about property rights in general. So we can talk about easements and things like that. And that's in that video if you want a little more information on how that might work, but that certainly applies. In this case, where you have a private individual who wants right over a coastal private landowner's land in order to access ocean resources, but we'll talk about how public, uh, how the public can also gain access. So, but fundamentally, we're talking about balancing these private and public rights, whether it's the the public right under the public trust doctrine to submerge lands and the ability to access those submerged lands for all of those public interests, right? And uh, we'll talk about what those are, generally speaking, or if it's the private landowner's right, because. In the United States and many other countries as well, but certainly in the United States, generally speaking, coastal property uh, is um, has it's it's highly sought after. It's limited. Uh, there's a limited amount of it, but it's highly sought after. And generally speaking, a person will pay a premium. They'll pay more for a coastal property uh, than they would for a equivalent similar piece of property and house if there's a house on it uh, that would be located further inland. And they pay that premium because there's a premium attached to living on the coastline, whether those are amenity values or some other things that are uh, the, re the, the basis of that premium. They're willing to pay more money to live on coastlines and near coastal areas than they are uh, further inland all other things being equal. And so we have to identify and understand those private interests and rights and that you know willingness to pay and what that means in terms of value and balance those private against public rights. And we'll talk about how we do that. Private coastal land owner rights, um, generally speaking, again, under property law principles, we talk about these uh, in the United States and many other countries as well as a sort of a bundle of rights, right? So there's not an unlimited amount of rights. And again, if you want to get into this in more detail, environmental law playlist, land use, you know, and public controls on land use and private controls as well. So look at those uh, videos in more detail if you want more on this. And of course, all kinds of associated uh, other materials that you can get from the what's described there from other research uh, that you might do. But in terms of private coastal landowner rights, when we say bundle of rights, there are all of these different rights that apply. They're not unlimited. When you buy or purchase private property in the United States, it doesn't mean that it gives you the right to do anything and everything that you'd want on that property. There are reasonable restrictions. There are, you know, if you want, you can't just build anything that you want on that property anywhere. Um, you know, most of us can understand there are certainly building code requirements. So what you build has to conform to certain health and safety standards. There are usually setback requirements that, you know, what you build can't be placed just anywhere on the property. In many states in the United States, there are wetland regulations. Certainly that's the case in the uh, in Massachusetts where I am, but in many other states as well. So if your property contains wetlands, there are limits on as to where you can build, whether you can fill those wetlands, how you can build near them, the kind of permitting that's required, so on and so forth. Um, so there are a number of things. And of course, outside of all of those, there's basic restrictions like I can't if I like to burn, and I use in the example, I think in the environmental law series uh, on this area in land use, um, if I want to burn as a matter of nuisance uh, tires on my property in my backyard, I can't just do this. I can't just do anything and everything that I want. If I want to, you know, store toxic chemicals uh, in my backyard, um, you know, my neighbors, I have a I have an obligation uh, to protect the interests of my neighbors, you know, my freedom, uh, as they say in the old saying there, that my, my individual freedom ends at the tip of the nose of the next person, just as their individual freedom rightfully and necessarily ends at the tip of my nose, because otherwise we wouldn't have individual freedoms. If my freedom extended beyond your uh, individual freedom and into your individual freedom, then you simply wouldn't have that freedom. It wouldn't exist because I would take it. Uh, my, you know, my desires and my, 
uh, my personal preferences would exceed, you know, your freedom space, your ability to express your own uh, freedoms and desires, so on and so forth. So we talk about these bundle of rights. They're not absolute, um, but one of the fundamental uh, reasons that we purchase private property, one of the reasons we do this and we place value on it, uh, is because we have the right to exclude other human beings from that property. It's fundamental. It's probably the most, one of the most important rights that you can imagine, because otherwise, what's the purpose, right? Um, there may be investment purposes and other things, but implicit in the value of private property is the notion that you can regulate human activity on that property. That's another way of saying the right to exclude. Um, the right to exclude is just one way of regulating, but you can limit what other humans can do on that property, whether they can access the property, et cetera. And that's fundamental. And, and probably a lot of the value that's wrapped up in the other things that we value, um, the aesthetics, the, the building, the living domicile, et cetera, they're all closely connected to this notion that, you know, I can use it for my desires and purposes with reasonable restrictions. Uh, and certainly I can prevent others. One of the most important ways that I can use that property is by preventing others from using that property. So that's what we mean by exclude or the right to exclude. In terms of public rights, um, the things that we're talking about really is, you know, so I want to access, you know, that submerged land, those the ocean, you know, I want to be able to access it. And so access, one of the questions we can ask is where, you know, it's not just that um, I can get to the water, be in the water, and then access that water for certain uses. It's it's how do I get to the water, right? How do I how do I move from private uplands? Imagine if there's a wall, a, an invisible wall of private properties that are all lying adjacent to each other, and they form. There's no spaces in between, no public spaces, no parks, no you know causeways, nothing nothing that allows for access, no easements, no public easements, that sort of thing. Just um, private land after private land after private land. And if I had this, I effectively create a, a logistical wall. If those private landowners aren't willing to provide me with access over their property, any of them, then I, as a member of the public, I really have no easy way to access that that public resource to access the water. I can't get to the beach. I can't get beyond the beach. I can't get into the water. So when we talk about public rights, one of the main issues that comes up is really about access. The other one is about use. It's how can I use, even if I have, let's say, access to the resource, to the submerged lands, how do I get to use that resource? Like, you know, how, how do I use it? Are there limitations on how I can use it? Can I use it in any way that I want? Or again, are there limitations placed on what's considered the public use of the, let's call it submerged land or ocean resources, water resources? And it's not just how, it's when. Are there time limits? Are there you know, uh, limited limits in terms of um, when I can access that for any particular purpose? And we talk about these things under the public trust doctrine. That's what PTD means here. PTD really is referring to the public trust doctrine. And so we want to understand. So uh, understanding this balancing of private and public rights, what we're getting at here is that we want to understand the legal frameworks. That's certainly one aspect of what we want to do. We want to know what legal frameworks apply. But we also want to consider from those legal frameworks or um, in conjunction with those legal frameworks, some of the policy issues and the implications of those policy issues deriving from the legal framework. So a lot of times the legal frameworks are setting the rules. Um, so those that know the game Monopoly or many other board games, um, the rules really matter. And sometimes in some games more than others, but you know the rules can get a little complex, but knowing the rules are incredibly important because what those rules do is they set out the manner in which you can move through the game, you can achieve the results you're seeking, that sort of thing. So knowing the rules are really important. And if we think about it, what the rules end up doing is they end up really setting the stage for all of our behavior patterns. How do I get to that point? How do I use certain, you know, cards? How do I use certain, you know, die? What if I roll this? What if I get this? And um, you, you can develop a strategy. You think of chess, for example. Chess has a set of rules, right? Depending on the whether you're a pawn versus a knight versus a rook versus a bishop versus a queen or a king, all of those different um, chess pieces, all of those, they they have different rules that apply to them, and. When you look at those rules, those rules help you develop a strategy. It's not just where they go on the board, another rule, right? How they initially are set up, but also the kinds of moves they can make. 
Uh, and those are all really important ways. That without those rules, you really don't establish a particular strategy. So when we're talking about policy issues, we're really talking about the way in which we think about how these rules, these legal frameworks, affect the way we think about creating, if we have a desired outcome, if we have a larger scale, a big picture um, policy outcome that we're hoping to achieve, those rules really impact and affect our way of thinking about how to get to that larger outcome. And that's what, we're, that's what I mean here. So when we understand the legal frameworks, they're important, but they're not important in and of themselves. They are, they're important as a necessary prerequisite or predicate to getting to the larger questions and issues, right? I need to know these rules so that I can understand what exists now and what are the options for, for alternate ways of existing. Um, and that's what we mean by the larger policy context. So that's law and policy are so important. You know, we always say that the law is the, you know, the final stage, the legitimation of, you know, so you have a policy making process and policy is legitimated through the lawmaking process. That's when the policy becomes official, when it becomes a law statute, for example, right? A proposal, a proposal of doing something. And so that's absolutely true. But as a matter of fact, whatever those proposals are, they set these then these basic frameworks. They in them themselves are a set of frameworks, a set of policies that, that are enacted through law that create these frameworks, these ways of behaving, these rules. And these rules then tell us what's possible. Um, they set limitations, but they also create opportunities, whether they're looked at individually or collectively together. So that's really what we're getting at, is we're looking at what are these major legal frameworks that affect coastal access in the United States for private citizens? How do they balance private landowner rights versus that public land rights, the rights of public citizens uh, to use the ocean in certain ways? And then based on those existing frameworks, what can we think about in terms of how can we use these in the future to think about new policy directions or to examine existing policies, so on and so forth. Some of the questions, how is a scarce and desirable resource, which is the coastal zone, as I mentioned, right? And it is. Um, the, a lot of the public wants to access the coastal zone for all kinds of uses. Um, and certainly private individuals love to be along the coastal zone, as I explained, um, you know, willing to pay premium uh, for the same uh, piece of property if it's located on the coast. So highly desirable and scarce, limited in supply. Um, how are they managed to balance these private and public interests? So how do how are they managed to, you know, and and also, how far can a government go to limit either public or private rights in attempting to achieve some stated or unstated policy objective? One thing that we can identify here up front is that whether it's the private landowner rights or the public rights, the government is involved and interested in both. It's interested in, as a matter of, and we'll talk about this and show this, you know, the private landowner rights, they create a lot of, um, the government gets a lot of benefits. And we'll talk about you know, taxation really quickly and that sort of thing. But the notion is there are invested, uh, vested interests for government to protect private property, private coastal property rights. And certainly there's also a matter of the public trust doctrine. Government has an obligation, forget about, you know, individual interests. The government has an obligation to act as trustee and to ensure that the, you know, that the benefits of that public property, submerged lands, are provided to the public. So it's more than just a, well, I'd like to do this if I could. It's an, it's an obligation that the government has as trustee. So in terms of policy setting, we can talk about public access. The government serves multiple functions and interests. It's kind of what I'm getting at here is the government owns submerged lands. It owns it and it holds it in trust for the public under the public trust doctrine. Thus, it is providing public uh, providing public access is a direct policy goal. It is an obligation of government, right? So that's that's not something that government can choose to vary from. It can't say, well, you know, uh, public access. Uh, it was important to this administration or you know this set of government officials um, that were you know representing government at this time, but it's really not important to them. So the next uh, set, so we can let it go, or we don't care about public access. We don't have to care about it. It's not something that's, it is not something that's a choice. It's an obligation. And that's a really important thing to know because that tells us that government always has to be involved and that public rights are paramount in many ways when we talk about uh, submerged lands, government uh, ensuring that the public has access for specific purposes to these submerged lands. So one form of government like coastal municipalities, right? Uh, the budget, their budget is connected to coastal home prices. A lot of, um, you know, and this is certainly in Massachusetts, but in many, most other states, you know, um, most of the functions of government, the, you know, we think about health, safety, and welfare, what local government provides, we think about uh, education, 
right? Uh, K through 12 education, public financing of education. We think about, uh, you know, your police force, right? You think about your ambulances, you think about your fire department, you think about, you know, basic social, local social services, those kinds of things. Most of the funding for all of those services, they come from um, local tax revenue sources. And most of the local tax revenue source comes from home assessments, comes from the value of private property. And so, you know, there is a strong connection between, um, if for coastal communities in particular, for people, private property owners, the valuation of that private coastal property, how it's valued, how it's assessed, and that direct relationship to tax revenues, revenue sources to provide those sort of health, safety, and welfare um, metrics. So there's, an, and what that what that means to us is that government is very interested in supporting these private property interests insofar as they uh, create strong demand and um, relatively high uh, assessments of property value, um, because then that directly correlates to how much tax revenue, you know, if you're taxing private real estate at one and a half percent for property tax purposes in your community, you know, if you, you know, if you have a coastal home that's worth a million dollars, you get one and a half percent of a million dollars, right? Versus it's fifteen thousand dollars. Versus, you know, uh, that same property um, being further inland in the same community, selling for half the price, right? Five hundred thousand dollars, right? So that's a, you know, that's fifteen hundred dollars, you know, instead of the, I'm sorry, uh, seventy five hundred dollars instead of the, you know, the higher uh, fifteen thousand dollars. So, you know, you can understand that this is important as a source of revenue um, and that the valuation is directly connected to that source of revenue. So uh, that local government certainly is interested in those valuations and anything that affects that valuation, the willingness of people to pay X amount of dollars uh, is going to be of interest. And certainly um, you can imagine uh, diminishing. So if if I own a piece of private property and it's located on the coastline and um, I can't prevent the public, for example, from accessing, from walking on a portion of my private property or just adjacent to my private property, walking across the beach that's located right next to, you know, with that is part of my private property and being able to either walk on the dry sand of the beach or to go down to the intertidal zone during low tide and walk on that wet sand or to otherwise be in the water in front of my house. If I if I can't prevent that and I have the public there, it diminishes. I still have the view shed, but it diminishes a lot of maybe the reason I would want to purchase or the, the amount of premium I'm willing to pay for that property because I no longer have you know unique sole access to not only the upland area, but also the area that then you know sort of migrates right into the water, basically my own private beach. I can't make the beach private for myself. And that obviously would affect probably many people's willingness to pay uh, for what, how much they're willing to pay, which would then would affect the price of the home, which then would affect assessment values, which then would lower tax revenue base. So government, you know, so government has obligations to the public. And sometimes those obligations, if they're fully realized in every way that they possibly could be, they can affect some of those private coastal uh, interests, which ends up creating mixed policy signals. So does government advanced public interests for access to coastal areas where doing so might negatively impact private interests, right? Does it do that? Or does government advance private interests in a way that inhibits public capacity to access the shoreline? This is where the, it's interesting because we can see, and we'll get to the underlying basis for this sort of, uh, you know, the legal framework basis for this sort of conundrum, this mixed policy signals. And we're not saying, by the way, that this is an and or, um, you know, there can always be an and also, you know, there's, <laughs> there are different ways of looking at things. So it's not a one or a zero, or you must choose one at the expense of the other, or it's a zero sum game. There are ways in which you can, you know, enhance public access, while also ensuring or enhancing or, or maintaining the high private value. Um, and, you know, but understanding that there is, by definition, at its base, a competing interest, a fundamentally competing interest, uh, between public access and private desires uh, in coastal areas is important. And this is not unique to the United States, but for many people, it's good to understand this is unique in some ways to the United States for public trust doctrine, historical purposes, et cetera. 
So the question really is about finding the right mix of public access and private rights. And it is in many ways, the ultimate policy goal in this arena. So managing these at base competing interests is really one of the ways in which we can think about the ultimate goal of, of government's role and coastal managers role in ensuring, you know, and we're only talking about access. We're not getting into any of the other, we deal with many other issues, sea level rise and, you know, all kinds of other issues and problems associated with our coastal areas and other, uh, other materials uh, for those in the course and uh, just for those in general interest and other video lectures uh, in this playlist on ocean policy and laws. Here we're just talking about in isolation, in a vacuum, we're just looking at these public and private uh, interests. In terms of some of the legal frameworks influencing public access, there are numerous legal frameworks that apply to this arena, but we're going to focus on just a couple of categorical areas. And so generally speaking, property law, certainly relevant. And what we mean is, you know, usually this is private property law in the United States and access related to physical property, specific geographic space, that matters. One of the reasons earlier I brought up the environmental law uh, playlist, the series on environmental law, particularly property, you know, we look at uh, property and or I think land use uh, more specifically. So look at those land use titles and then land use overview, private rights, and then public rights uh, in land. We're talking about property law. And there's a good overview there of the different types of instruments that apply privately, publicly in order to regulate land in the United States, private land. Um, that's really the principles, the underlying principles there are property law. And so why does property law matter? Because it's fundamental. It's fundamental what we're talking about. What are private property rights? What are those bundle of rights? What are the limitations, the reasonable 10th Amendment zoning regulations that government can apply, right? When does government go too far? When does it regulate so far that it constitutes uh, maybe a regulatory taking under the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution? There's a constitutional right at stake, you know, so private landowners are protected against unreasonable government inter uh, interferences in their use of their land. Uh, and there's a way in which we, we have a whole sort of takings analysis. This is when government doesn't want to. Government also has the power, by the way, to take private property as long as they pay just compensation under the Fifth Amendment as well. That's eminent domain power. But when they don't want to pay, when they don't want to actually, you know, turn the private property into public property, uh, you know, so the example there is, hey, you know, there's no public access to this uh, shoreline and we want to create public access. So we're just going to purchase your private property and turn it into a park, an access point for the public. And we're going to pay you just compensation, fair market value at the time that we take this property. And therefore, we're going to then raise your building and we're going to turn it into, again, a parking lot with a bit of a park and that sort of thing, get access to that government. As long as that's considered a public use, which in this case, I think in most instances, it would uh, be considered a public use. As long as they pay a fair market value, the you know, government has that authority in the United States Constitution under the Fifth Amendment. Most of the time, government wants to ensure public access to coastal areas, but it doesn't want to pay for it. It doesn't want to pay the full value. And again, there are other reasons that it wouldn't because, of course, every piece of government property that's taken instead of it being private property lowers that tax base, at least for the local municipality, right? You don't have a private property owner paying property taxes anymore because now it's a public piece of land. So it's not only the upfront cost of purchasing the property, but it's the, you know, extended costs, the overtime, uh, you know, costs of losing that uh, revenue resource. That's also something to consider, but all of this is based on property law. And the other area, as I mentioned under the Fifth Amendment, is constitutional law. And that's when government action that impacts private and public citizens' rights. So we talked about the public trust doctrine. That's fundamental. That is a fundamental area of background law. It's an obligation. It is imbued into the United States Constitution, and it's a requirement of how government functions and acts for its citizens. So that is fundamental as well. I said eminent domain under the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution, but also everything else, every other government regulation, whether it's zoning, whether it's, you know, the government actions that limit, don't remove, but limit private rights in land, right? You know, limit some of those bundles of rights uh, in some way or another that is considered to be within government's purview, it doesn't go too far. Uh, that's under the Tenth Amendment to the United States Constitution, the police powers, so to speak, that health, safety, and welfare I mentioned earlier for local governments. This is all well explained, again, in the environmental law, land use, public and private rights. You can look at it in more detail there. Um, but that's what we're talking about when we're talking about constitutional law, these basic constitutional sort of rights that run into property when it's private rights versus public rights. So the concepts of property and constitutional law, 
They help us understand the options and limitations of policy proposals. What can government do to support public and private coastal rights? And when do potential government actions simply go too far? These are some of the questions we can ask. For those that haven't seen this, if you go back to the land use, if you go to the overview in environmental law, and I think even this is some of the introductory materials here in ocean policy and law, but certainly the overview of environmental law, you can see, or, you know, we have an entire, excuse me, we have an entire video on hierarchy of laws in our administrative law playlist. So if you want to go to administrative law, I think there's three or four videos. You can find hierarchy of law. It's a great one. And you can get a good in-depth discussion, a good hour or so, uh, talking about this notion, this, this sort of framework of a hierarchy of laws here in the United States. And all we're saying here is we're just reminding ourselves that when we talk about whether it's the Fifth Amendment rights against a government going too far, uh, taking of public pro of private property, excuse me, without just compensation or regulation that goes so far as to constitute a taking, all under the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution, fundamental government rights to place restrictions on some of those private property rights and some of those bundles of rights, as long as they don't go too far, 10th Amendment, the US Constitution, and fundamentally public trust doctrine, uh, which is a mix of both uh, legal requirements, but also constitutional requirements. So we're talking about really high end order where obligations exist by government uh, and in and to do things on behalf of the public to ensure the public can yield the value of those submerged land rights, right? Because it holds it in trust for the public's benefit. And also at the same time, you know, to ensure that whatever it does does not violate fundamental individual private rights. And so there's that balance to be struck there. That's really what we're talking about here. We're at the highest end. So anything government would do, any laws that they would create or any regulations they would create in any way to affect so if they wanted to create zoning laws and regulations, for example, they were all subservient. All of those things are subservient. They cannot go so far as to violate that constitutional protection because it is paramount. That's what we're just uh, getting at here. The other thing that we can do is since we're talking about the Fifth Amendment, particularly about like regulatory takings, about you know uh, actions that go so far as to violate private property rights, go too far and then take actually take away a road to zero that private property right versus legitimate government regulations that don't go so far, which would be under the 10th Amendment. We can look at that as kind of a spectrum here. We can say, you know, we can look at these kind of actions when government is balancing its, you know, its, its obligations under the public trust doctrine to provide public access against its both desire to ensure private property rights are maintained and its desire to, you know, to limit some of those private property rights in cases where it wants to create public access or give public, ensure public, uh, the, 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 the uses of the coastal zone can be realized by the public by, you know, most importantly, access usually, uh, you know, uh, legitimate Tenth Amendment power against going too far under the Fifth Amendment. And what we can say is that what we often find, and certainly this is uh, true in the case law, is that we find uh, most of the, the fact patterns where we're in this sort of like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if government has gone too far. I'm not sure if that's a legitimate statement. I'm not sure if the uh, rights have been eroded so far or versus, you know, uh, vice versa. I'm, I'm not sure that this government regulation is legitimate. It might have gone too far. It's sort of in this, this yellow field where we don't really know. And what that case law does is there's a number of cases, and we talk about this under some of the public controls, again, in the environmental law of land use course, you can talk about the major cases, uh, summarize those major cases, but case law helps us narrow this yellow box, helps us understand in context, you know, and makes that over time, under different fact patterns, it helps us, you know, uh, sort of shrink that yellow box smaller and smaller so that there's less of the unknown as to whether certain actions are more likely to be one or the other. And so we have a little bit more definition over time. But that's just, this is just another way for us to visually think about this sort of balancing act that's being played out, uh, the multiple interests at least at the constitutional level on these private property rights. So applying these legal frameworks to public access, we can show on the right a general scenario where we have, here's our general upland, here's what's normally a line of vegetation, um, here's an intertidal zone, so you can see like the sandy beach and then the wet area during low tides, say portion of this is wet sand, you know, and up uh, the upper portion is the dry sandy beach. 
and then you have maybe some dunes it depends on where you are but you might have some you know dunes with some spartina some line some some vegetation I mean, vegetation can be grassy it can be you know uh, woody uh, woody shrubs, that sort of thing, but that usually um, helps to hold the sand, you know, some of the sand and helps to prevent it from eroding away and provide it also, if they're dunes, a resource uh, uh, for new sand uh, to sort of fill in here. And then you have the ocean. And you can think that in this upland is what's called this private property. And there's a private home. And what we're talking about here is how does the public, again, if we had this conceptually, just if there's no access point, for the public to get to this area to start using some of those public trust doctrine ocean uses that are you know set aside for the public's use without being able to access it you know you'd have to take a helicopter or something and you know so how do how, how does how does the public get access and that's really what we're talking about here where's the goal can we create sort of like a an access point here and then how do we do that obviously um doing so impacts private property rights if that access didn't exist before uh, so it has it has a role to play uh, in terms of trying to understand how these legal frameworks might play out. So main legal doctrines to justify, maintain, or create public access in the United States. What are the main legal doctrines? What are some of these legal frameworks that either maintain an existing public access, create it from scratch, um, I'm sorry, or create it from scratch, that kind of thing. And so we have these main sort of uh, instruments. We have prescription, dedication, customary use, and public trust. These are four major ways. And we'll talk about a couple of these uh, and go into a little more de detail. We talked a bit about these ideas of how do we create access when these are mostly talking about access that goes against a landowner's desire, a private landowner's desire to, to have that access. And so, you know, we talked about prescription um, uh, in terms of adverse possession in the land use. Um, when we talk about land under uh, environmental law, uh, so if you were if you've looked at that or if you're thinking about looking at that, you'll get more of a sense of what this is talking about. But prescription is effectively uh, the same thing. It, prescription is really a type of easement. We can think about this sort of orange area, right? And it's gained by use against the landowner's interest over time. Effectively, what happens is that you have a landowner with private property and people, regardless of the fact that it's private property, regardless of that fact, and even regardless of a keep out sign or a private property, they start trotting a path and using this and they've been doing it for a period of time and using it for access so what you have to provide usually for an easement by prescription as a mechanism a private mechanism to create um, something that government would officially identify uh, you know legitimize over a period of time is this sort of uh this this notion of um prescription and we have to show four things uh hoac is the acronym that we use it has to be hostile so the people have to be doing this against the landowner's interest. If the landowner says, welcome, please use this well-trodden path for access to the beach, you don't have an easement by prescription because it's not hostile. It's not against the landowner's interest. Landowner is happy to have you. Whereas if you have a trespassing sign, that sort of thing, it's pretty obvious it's against the landowner's interest. But the point is it has to be against the landowner's interest. It has to be open. So it can't be something that's you know secret, circumspect, and you know it has to be open. It has to be obvious. So if the landowner was to inspect the area, it would be obvious that people are using this as an access point. You would find a hole in a fence. You would find a well-trodden path. You know where you could see a pathway that because people kept you know walking over it, that it no longer grew, you know vegetation, that sort of thing. You just it has to be open. It has to be actual. It has to actually be used. Right. That so it's it's not something that you're pretending to use for access, right? Where you go and you make it once and you uh you never use it again, but you're trying to create the impression that this is a thing that's being used. So it has to be actually used for that intended purpose, by the way, not just accessing the landowner's property, but accessing the coastline. You know, so oh, we love to go here and we love to stop here and we love to build a little fire and you know have some drinks and hang out at night. And that's it. And we really don't access it. You know, it has to be for accessing the ocean, right? So it has to be actual in that way. And it has to be continuous. And continuous means it depends on the jurisdiction because it's mostly at the state level, somewhere between five and 20 years. And if you have all of these things, and if you do this, then effectively what ends up happening, excuse me, is that you can gain actually sort of like a you can gain legal right. You can go to court and actually get a legal right to create this easement, this permanent easement against private property, even against the landowner's interest, mind you. This isn't something where the landowner says, sure, go ahead, we'll do an easement and you know, no problem. I don't mind you accessing. This is, again, it's against their interest. 
So you can gain access this way. This is without the public, without government being involved. Once it's created, it creates an access point, and that's important for the government because access points are something that the government wants to maintain for public trust doctrine. So we have this this method, this uh, easement by prescription, and that's really against private interest against private interest. You have private individuals doing something that the government isn't supporting. The government hasn't created this. The government's not doing it itself, um, but it's being done over a long period of time, and then the government will by law, by legal mechanism, right, identify and, and sort of validate this method of access. Another one is implied dedication. Implied dedication is, it's like a prescriptive easement. So it requires public users to intend a trespass, right? Same thing, going against, using against the landowner's interest for a required period of time. So these, it's just a different way of saying, of say, uh, you know, it's just a different term that's used in different states. So sometimes you have, you know, a prescriptive easement, effectively the same thing as implied dedication. It's just that what's happening is that it's being dedicated, that use is being dedicated for this purpose, regardless of um, the landowner's intent. You know, when the landowner allows access, it's usually called in these areas where there's implied dedication, these particular states that use it, it's called a dedication by acquiescence. Obviously, it's, a, you know, I'm fine with it. It's I've created an easement, I've acquiesced to the easement. And then, you know, the implied dedication is where the landowner does not allow the access and it happens over that period of time. So there's that. And so implied dedication is very similar. It's very much a similar process, just a different terminology you might hear uh, and understand. But again, somebody can get an implied dedication. Uh, over, you know, without having to show ne necessarily HOAC, the hostile, open, actual, and continuous, um, but uh, essentially the same elements, uh, most of those same elements, and then they get access, legitimized if they go to court, and, you know, support it, that sort of thing. And then there's public trust doctrine. So the public trust doctrine prevents public interest in water resources from being alienated. So un fundamental to the public trust doctrine is this idea that, you know, in order to realize the purposes of submerged lands, the purposes by the public of submerged lands, there has to be access. So you cannot alienate access. So private landowners can't go in, which is a historical access point, let's say, and then take over that access point and prevent access. So it's based on necessary access to invoke public trust doctrine rights. And traditional public trust doctrine rights, fundamental public trust doctrine rights are fishing, fouling, and navigation. Fouling is bird hunting. I know it's a strange term. It's just old. It's uh, probably derived from old English. But so basically, the the traditional reasons the public would want to access the shoreline for basic sort of survival reasons, sort of that Ma Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. If we talk about basic needs, right, food, shelter, and clothing, fishing, fouling, and navigation. That kind of like I need. It's a necessary for me to access in order to sustain myself. So this isn't really about recreation. It's, I mean, there's recreational components to it, certainly today. A lot of fishing is recreational. Bird hunting is recreational for those that do it. Navigation, I mean, navigation, we're talking about like kayaking and, you know, anything and everything you can imagine, sailing, that sort of thing. So they all have high, highly recreational components today, but it's not, you know, historically, it's not based on just recreation. It's based on, you know, uh, sort of deeper. And that's why it's these kinds of rights, these fishing, following navigation, but it's based on this necessary access. And some states, so what that means is that when you have access, or even if you don't, that access is implied. So Massachusetts has a law, for example, and in that law, it says that always public access to the beaches, to shorelines has to be maintained. So whenever you're doing something, whenever you're, you want to, you know, it's privately owned, but there has to be public access. You want to build something that hasn't been built. You want to, you know, build something anew, that sort of thing. You have to include access points for the public to the shoreline if it's going to create impediments. It effectively creates this requirement of access. And it's almost as an access by necessity, as a matter of ensuring the public trust doctrine can be realized. Some states, like New Jersey, extend these public trust doctrine rights to recreation. And when I mean recreation, I don't mean the fishing recreation, you know, bird hunting recreation or, you know, navigation or just sailing or whatever it might be, surfing, so on and so forth. They include sunbathing and swimming, which extends the access rights not only to the, you know, at least, you know, intertidal zone, low water, you know, wet sand, but also to the upland area as well, ensures that the public can access through these areas in order to use the upland area for sunbathing, that sort of thing. In the others, in traditional fishing, following navigation, access might be provided, but it's only to get to the wet. 
It's only to get to in Massachusetts, it would have to be beyond the low water mark, uh, or at least if the high waters there, walking in the intertidal zone, or you know, navigating or fishing and fouling, basically walking for fishing or fouling, or you know, putting your boat in that sort of thing, your 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 kayak, your canoe, or you know, whatever it is, your paddleboard, whatever you might be doing. So it's more associated with connecting it to the water itself, whereas you know, New Jersey and a few other states have really have pushed public trust doctrine into the dry land area, which is fascinating. So that's a situation where you can be a private landowner and you've got people accessing, you know, the sandy portion, the dry sand portion of your uh, of your private property, uh, so they can sit there and lay there and that sort of thing. So you can imagine the effect that might have on willingness to pay for private landowners, that sort of thing. But some states do that. So that's public trust doctrine. Now, one of the things that we can mention here uh, relatively quickly is the Nolan Dolan cases. You could look up Nolan Dolan. It's certainly in the materials if people are interested that are in the course. But those that aren't taking this course and are just interested, there's uh, unlimited amounts of detailed material on Nolan Dolan, the two uh, U.S. Supreme Court cases, uh, the Nolan case in particular, um, you know, uh, to understand this all happened in California, but to understand um, other ways of creating public access. And I have here sort of, um, you can imagine coastal California, you know, and you can imagine the beaches, you have high value coastal real estate, that sort of thing. So you have a situation where you have private landowner creating that sort of wall that I mentioned earlier, where there's just, you know, private landowner abutting private landowner abutting private landowner, and there's no access points. And what happens is that you want to create these access points, but you can't just do it, say under public trust doctrine, you can't just say, snap the fingers, because otherwise that would require taking, right? So you would think that if the government wanted to create an access point like this, and there was no other method to do it, it can't just say, well, as a matter of necessity, the public needs to gain access. And therefore, by magic, we're going to create this access point and you just have to deal with it. We're, we're taking effectively a portion of your property and we're not going to pay just compensation. That would technically be, in most cases, a regulatory taking. And the Nolan Dolan cases kind of played that out. Um, but if we think about other ways, we can think about from a policy standpoint, how could government do this without exacting a taking? And we talk about access by development approval, for example. So a lot of times what ends up happening is, oh, I'm a wealthy individual. Think of today. And here's a, you know, a bungalow. It's got a great location. It's right along the ocean, right? But it's a bungalow and I really want to have a big house, right? So I want to turn this bungalow into a larger home, right? That's what I want to do. And in order for me to do this, I have to get a building permit. So what California did is it started saying, okay, as a condition, so you might meet all other building requirements, setback requirements, size, you know, um, you know, earthquake proofing, et cetera, all the building standards, et cetera. You might meet all of those requirements for a larger building and your plans and everything seems okay. But as a condition of approving the building, the permit of the building of tearing down the bungalow and putting this larger structure, we're going to demand that you provide access. Uh, to the ocean resource. And it's fascinating because a couple of cases where in Nolan, uh, technically, uh, the California Permitting Authority made a mistake because um, they conditioned the access for um, the public on the viewing, on view. So they said you need to provide access for people to physically move, run, go across your property so they can maintain a view. Of the ocean. And one of the fundamental purposes, the US Supreme Court struck that down and it said you can't condition physical access on view because they're two different kinds of things. There's not a sufficient nexus between the thing that you're trying to get, the goal, which is the view to ensure a view shed, right? So people can look at the ocean and look at the, you know, uh, out into the sea and the shoreline, right? So, you know, a question of view isn't necessarily a question of physical access to the resource. And so, oof, you know, that was Dolan. It was the fix where it was like, okay, you're right, I'm sorry. So that makes sense. So we need to have a sufficient nexus between our proposal. So of course, as I mentioned earlier, the purpose of the um, of the requirement of the access requirement as a condition of the building permit has to be connected with physical access. So for people physically accessing the beach and the ocean. And that's what Dolan really talks about is that sort of fix. Uh, so that, um, you know, and this was seen to be completely and utterly and has been upheld as completely constitutional. So what ends up happening is that as long as the key is ensuring the condition is closely connected to the purpose of the condition, that's the Nolan Dolan distinction, right? So the condition physical access is connected to actually providing access as opposed to view. Uh, as long as that's uh, there's a there's a sufficient nexus there, 
that they're connected, um, you're pretty much good to go. So this is an interesting policy solution to the problem of public access, where your government needs to do something where it doesn't have the money to afford, and also, you know, some of the political consequences probably uh, with just engaging in eminent domain and taking a lot of private property, or portions of private property, create, you know, levels of public access, all different kinds of public access up and down the coast. It's like, well, you know what, we, um, you know, we're not forcing you uh, to want to redevelop your property. That's your choice. And when you make that choice, uh, we can uh, put this requirement of public access to ensure our public trust doctrine, you know, requirements are being met. Since we're not forcing you to do this, you don't have to make a change. But when you choose to make a change, um, that seems to be okay. The Supreme Court said that's a type of 10th Amendment sort of police power, government power that doesn't go so far as to exact a taking because of this sort of balancing of the interests. And so that's a, a really important way when I said that the yellow box, that those cases help us understand how that yellow box gets reduced over time. This is one of the ways it does it. It does it by helping us understand, well, under these legal frameworks, how can we implement a policy that we want, a policy solution that might be, again, a, uh, a, a, a you know, a win-win uh, situation where you have the public trust doctrine obligations and you want to meet those obligations under access requirements, but you also have, of course, the private interests. And of course, the people, they purchase the property desiring in order to make it their own. Uh, and you're allowing that to happen. They can make it more what they want, but they might, you know, as a result, as a consequence, also have to provide some access points. Um, but they get something much closer to what they originally intended when they purchased the property. And we can also say that it's very likely that for the government, that the bungalows, you know, assessed value is probably something that's less than the larger structure now, right? It probably has a higher assessed value, and therefore there's more tax revenue. So you're sort of getting a win-win situation in that way, where you're increasing tax, maintaining at the least, if not increasing tax revenue, while also ensuring public trust doctrine objectives are being met. So there's a, an example under Nolan Dolan, where government can, from a policy standpoint, achieve its objectives without going so far as to either exact a taking uh, through regulation of the private property, while also uh, actually enhancing, in some ways, the private property, at least in terms of economic value, direct economic value. As a matter of final thoughts, the purpose of this section is really twofold. First, we should understand the often competing goals of public access and private ownership in coastal areas. That's something that is fundamental is that in the United States, there are often competing goals between ensuring public access and, you know, both, you know, legitimizing private ownership, uh, incentivizing private ownership, and also in some ways relating that incentive of private ownership to heightened values, coastal values for, for purposes of ensuring, you know, high tax base, that kind of thing. So government has interest in both in supporting both access and private rights. And balancing those interests is a key for policymakers. So that's first point. Second, we should, uh, we should uh, understand the basic legal frameworks that exist in this area, the basic legal frameworks. And we understand that there's property law frameworks and constitutional law frameworks, particularly the fifth versus 10th amendment, but that these are all important ways. These legal frameworks are fundamental in us, uh, in us seeing the larger policy context uh, that might apply. And then third, even though it's twofold, this, this extra third uh, item that we can also consider is we should be, we should be understand, excuse me, understanding, but understand the relative merits and issues surrounding different public access frameworks. We should be able to understand these frameworks, prescription, dedication, public trust doctrine. By understanding them, we can see where there are these tools and then maybe overlaying Nolan Dolan and some other cases about how government can work to sort of balance these interests. And in some cases, and hopefully in many cases, create outcomes that are maybe not ideal for either participant, right? Maybe those that want public access don't want to have big private residences they'd rather have those smaller bungalows, right? But getting public access is better than no public access. And on the other end, um, you know, the private individual wants to have the large, you know, whatever they want, the, the, the kind of property that they want without public access. But having the kind of property they want is better than the bungalow, even if it requires, you know, uh, the suboptimal uh, solution, which is in requiring or allowing public access to a portion in order to access the ocean resources for using those ocean resources. So we can see how this all kind of works together. That's it. That's a quick, relatively quick summary of a very complex area, which is public, uh, public and private rights in terms of accessing coastal resources in the United States. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you.